Uh, I'm Peter Van Loan. I'm the lead forester for the Vermont Land Trust. And thank you all so much for taking the time out of your evening, a beautiful evening, to come <clears throat> to this presentation. This came about because the Vermont Land Trust owns a hill farm in Woodstock where we have a hay field and we've been struggling for years to try to figure out what to do. And lucky for me, last year I uh, emailed Liza and she helped me start to think about <clears throat> how to manage that field properly for bobolinks. We had been having it uh, mowed late in the season for the previous seven or so years, but we got a lot more information by talking to her just on a, in a couple of hours. And then we had Liza and Kevin come do a presentation uh, to our Vermont Land Trust staff who meet with the, about 2,000 uh, owners of conserved land around the state so that they would have information to pass on to landowners who are curious about how to <clears throat> manage for grassland birds. So uh, with that, I will turn over to Liza and Kevin and let them take it away. Awesome. Yeah, thank you for having us. I'm really happy to be here on such a gorgeous day. Um, I'm not sure if we want to do, do, want to do questions now or do you want to wait a little bit? It's entirely up to you. Kevin, let's let's get this party started and then do oh, questions uh, a little bit later. Cool. Okay. Um, so as uh, Peter mentioned, we are from the Vermont Center for Eco Studies. VCE uh, is a nonprofit conservation research organization that's uh, headquartered in Norwich. We mainly focus on insects uh, such as bumblebees and butterflies, birds, and vernal pool amphibians. And in addition, in addition to the VCE's history of grassland bird research. Uh, we also have this outreach program as well um, regarding land management for grassland birds throughout primarily Vermont, but also a little bit into the upper valley of New Hampshire. Um, and then we try to offer assistance to anyone that comes asking for it. And when we're talking about grassland birds, um, when we're talking about grassland birds, um, there's kind of two groups that people think of. Um, one is this group, and that's birds that are kind of associated with grasslands and agriculture. But unlike the birds that we're really focusing on for our work, these birds don't nest in a hay field or on the ground. They may nest, say, in a cavity, such as the, like a bluebird that a lot of people like, or on the underside of a barn, such as a barn swallow. But they're not directly affected by management, um, such as haying, in most areas because they don't nest directly on the ground. When we're talking about grassland birds, oh, we're talking about grassland birds, we are talking about these species that nest directly on the ground. Um, we really only have three in major numbers here, or I guess even two in major numbers and one in slightly less numbers. And those are the bobolink on um, Savannah Sparrow, and then to a lesser extent, the Eastern Meadowlark. During the boom of the sheep industry during, in, uh, in Vermont in the you know, early to mid 1800s, when over three quarters of the land was cleared for pasture, made a lot of available habitat for these species. But now as Vermont's becoming reforested, which is you know, a fantastic thing, I'm not anti-forestry, um, that means that there's less habitat for grassland birds in the state. And so again, that really results in having these species in much lower numbers than historically. Additionally, as we've shifted from sheep-based agriculture to dairy, um, dairy requires different management practices because they need more nutrient decay. Uh, all, all this to say is they have a really, a really sharp decline in Vermont, which is um, echoed throughout the U.S. and Canada. As this graph shows, grass and birds are the fast declining group of birds in North America. This is for a host of reasons um, that we'll hopefully touch on. Most of them are going to be related to the land use um, changes throughout their range. This is kind of the historic range of uh, Vermont's native grasslands, the, uh, the Midwestern prairies. The green is short, or is a, the green is tall grass prairies, which is kind of like the, the classic golden prairie you think of. Uh, the hay grows to be about six feet tall in that area. But as you can see, really the dark green is the only remaining tall grass prairie left. So that's a huge decline in that habitat. And that's echoed in the short grass prairie, which is more of like the scrubby, um, grows about 10 inches, a little bit less rain, which is still some habitat for them. But again, that's declined quite a bit. Hold on, I'm, I'm getting um, a message that um, some people are having trouble seeing the figures. I just wanna, um, if anyone else is having trouble uh, seeing 
our slides for some reason. Um, if you can throw a message in the chat box, um, I'm not exactly sure what's happening there, but um, I want to make sure we're not going through this presentation without people being able to see it. So, um, yeah, I apologize for whoever is having that trouble, and hopefully, it's just one one person. Yeah, okay. I, I try. I trace. I say try leaving the meeting and re-entering. Other than that, um, our options are pretty limited at the moment. Well, so we'll just forge ahead. Um, okay. Um, in Vermont, although this is well outside of the native U.S. prairies, at least in the in the more recent past, there has historically been grasslands here, you know, thousands of years ago. But historically, um, for our immediate past, gra Vermont and most of the Northeast has been, you know, reforested almost entirely. But now Vermont has about 8% of its total land cover, which is grassland. And that's pretty much all due to the agricultural land history. Um, that's cool because that gives us a lot of opportunities for conservation, as you can see in the, in the, the map to the left, where uh, Champlain Valley, Franklin County, and Orleans with the darker blue all have high potential for conservation value for grassland birds. And this is kind of also echoed in the fact that um, Franklin County hosts some of the rarest grassland species in the state. For instance, it hosts the only one or two pairs of nesting upland sandpipers. So that's a very valuable area in Vermont for grass and bird conservation. And I'm just gonna kind of touch a little bit on the three species that we're gonna be focusing most on for this. Uh, one is the Eastern Meadowlark on the top. That requires the most land out of these three species. Uh, requires more or less about 20 acres to really uh, get a foothold. Bobolink and Savannah Sparrow require a little bit less. Uh, we kind of say, uh, oh, Jack said you can see him now, awesome. Um, Bobolink and Savannah Sparrows require less habitat than the Meadowlark, which kind of explains why they are here in larger numbers. They, as I mentioned earlier, nest on the ground in hay fields and they avoid field edges. So they like trying to be in the center of large hay fields if possible. And because of the fact that they nest on the ground, that makes them highly susceptible to improper management regime because the entire habitat they live in is human managed within Vermont. So that makes them really, really delicate management wise. And when we focus on bobolink and savannah sparrows, it's important to realize that when we focus on bobolink, which is the one we'll be talking most about, we are also managing for other grassland birds as well. As you can see here, grassland birds are on a continuum from short vegetation to long vegetation which also mirrors things such as the litter layer and the grazing intensity. When you're managing for bobolinks, bobolink and spinner sparrows have pretty similar <laughs> and, and the metal oak, while not quite the same, is again, relatively similar, especially in the vegetation height area. Just a little background on bobolinks. Um, they, they winter uh, in South America, mostly in Argentina, Uruguay. Um, a little bit scattered throughout some other regions, and then they nest in uh, Northeast US into Southern Canada. Um, we recently did a webinar that outlines bobolink ecology, and we can post a link to that later. Um, so we're not focusing on their life history and ecology as much as we are focusing on how to manage them to improve their reproductive potential. So, Thank you for that wonderful segue, Kevin. Um, so we're mo gonna move now into the management um, and you know the habitat uh, requirements sort of section of the workshop. And um, one thing I will just say is that we want this to be interactive. We want this to be helpful to you all as landowners. And so, um, or potentially as concerned neighbors who maybe know landowners who uh, have habitat. Um, and so if you have a question, please throw it in the chat box. We're happy to answer questions throughout. Um, and we will be going over both the, the habitat needs of the birds, some management um, options, as well as some case studies of sort of theoretical landowners that we um, with scenarios that we encounter on a fairly regular basis um, to sort of give you an idea of, of what um, a management 
um, plan might look like on your own property. Uh, but we want it to be really tailored to you. So please, you know, throw those questions in the chat box. Um, before we move forward, I think this is the right time for the poll, Peter, if you don't mind throwing that up there. So we just wanted to get a better idea of what all of you are dealing with in terms of your needs as landowners, whether, you know, your familiarity with these birds, um, what sort of habitat you have on your property, that kind of thing. So um, if you could respond to some of these questions, that would be great. Uh, there should be seven questions, right? I think that's how many we said. So hopefully you're seeing all seven. I'm only seeing two, but... If you, oh, if you oh, scroll, if scroll down, down, you can there see we all go. seven. All right. And this is all anonymous, so um, none of your answers will be specific to you. So we'll just give everyone a, a minute. I'm not seeing any answers come in. I don't know if that's because- Yeah, that's got me puzzled it. a little bit. <clears throat> Are folks having trouble responding? I think we have to answer all the questions first and then hit submit and then all the responses will come in at once. Okay, thanks Rebecca. Yeah. There's a problem with question seven. It looks to me like they're all one response. Something bad went on. Hmm. Yes, that is true. Well, Ignore question, answer just one of the, one of the four randomly. <laughs> okay, well, it's great when technology works and it's sad <laughs> when it doesn't. But what we were hoping to get an idea about was um, the, the questions were, how would you describe your surroundings? How big is your largest field? What are the main goals you have as a landowner? How is your field cut? If it's annually, biannually, by someone else, by you. Um, oh, now answers are coming in though. Um, how long has your largest field been hayed or managed the same way? Um, and sort of how familiar are you with bobolinks and whether or not you have them, you know you have them in your fields. Um, so the idea, these are all sort of the kind of questions we would be asking landowners when we do site visits with them, um, which we'll get to that uh, towards the end as an option for you. Um, but it's, these are just good things to be thinking about yourself um, in terms of uh management on your property um say so okay. yeah i would just say let's not you know don't stress if you're if you're not um able to answer all the questions i'm going to get started talking about um management and maybe peter leave it open another minute um or so and then we'll close it and we'll just go with that um this is like i said just helping us to get an idea of who you are. You can also throw that information about um, yourself and your property and grassland birds in the chat box if you would like. So um, when we think about management, we're thinking about the interaction of a number of things. Um, we're thinking about the habitat needs of the birds. We're thinking about the threats that they face um, and how habitat, how they're adapted to, to use habitats to um, in some ways avoid those threats. And then we're also thinking about how management can either um, heighten, uh, support the habitat characteristics that they like, could potentially exacerbate the risk of predation, things like predation, um, um, or could maybe like make not make sense for uh, the birds or for your needs. So, you know, it's human, it's the human dimension, um, it's the habitat preferences, and then it's the natural um, or potentially unnatural threats that these birds face. Um, so when we talk about threats and habitat characteristics, there's sort of these large existential threats, which are our climate change and our habitat conversion, those are major threats that all birds face and particularly grassland birds, but they're not threats that we can deal with on a um, 
property to property level uh, so much. And so we're not gonna focus on that um, tonight, but we're gonna focus on the risks of intensive mowing, predation, um, and invasive plants. And we're gonna talk about what do our bobolinks like here in Vermont? So when, oop, excuse me, when we um, are talking about what a bobolink homeowner is looking for in their dream home, um, we sort of think about this checklist. So you have your field size and shape, your openness, the, the level of openness and the amount of edge you have um, in a property, uh, the, what the surrounding landscape looks like, the bird's eye view, so to speak, of the land, um, the vegetation structure within the field itself, uh, and the dryness of that field. Um, so within those categories, these check boxes represent kind of what a bobolink would want. And the important thing to understand, these are very sort of rough um, generalizations um, that hold true more or less depending on the region and depending on the extent to which other boxes are checked. So we have highlighted the greater than 10 acres box because the bigger the field you have is, the less important all of the other boxes are. Um, but, you know, if the field is very small, it's more important that you have more of those other boxes checked. And in a given field, um, a bobolink, bobolinks may nest despite not having certain boxes checked, whereas in other fields you might find that, you know, that they are more willing or more or less willing to tolerate those things. Um, so first off is field size and shape. So as I said, the bigger the better, but the important thing is also the shape. So in Vermont that we have plenty of fields that are oddly shaped. Um, we live in a mountainous state there. We don't have the ability to have these massive square fields like you have out in the Midwest. Um, and so you often have fields that look like this 25 acre field to the left that's kind of this wonky um, little squiggle. Uh, and the reason that that's not as preferred is because of just the basic facts of ge basic geometry. When you have, oop, I'm sorry, when you have that weird shape, you have more edge habitat um, relative to interior habitat. And as Kevin said previously, that interior habitat is really where the bobolinks want to be nesting. Um, there, that is to a certain degree to avoid predation. Um, it's a certain to degree to the fact that bobolinks also perceive a risk of predation in the edges of fields, whether or not that risk is real. Um, so they will prefer to nest in a field like the one to the right, um, which even though it's slightly smaller, has more of that interior habitat. So you can see here how size is important, but it also interacts with shape. This gets at also the idea of edges and that we don't love edges for grassland birds. Um, edges in addition to their very existence being problematic from a nesting point of view, um, what they are also matters. So as you can see here, we're getting at the idea of openness. Um, this angle uh, shown here is, is to just give you, to give you an idea. When you're standing out in your field and you're looking out um, from the center of the field out around you, you wanna be thinking about what is the, um, what is the view shed? We use this word view shed a lot. Um, are you able to feel like you can see forever or do you feel like the, um, the view is really uh, infringed upon by some sort of edge, whether that be trees, um, a hedgerow, an, some sort of agricultural uh, edge, uh, possibly some corn um, or other crop. Uh, field or potentially a road or a human development. Sometimes you have these edges uh, on top of each other where you have trees and a road um, and those just all add 
to the fragmentation of the field, but also the impact on the view shed and the openness. And the reason this is important is again, that perceived risk of predation. Um, bobolinks like to be able to see for a long distance because um, there's a per, uh, sense of perceived um, safety, that they're going to be able to see a predator coming from a long ways off, um, and that will increase their risk of survival for themselves and potentially also for their chicks. Um, also, kind of going off that, just answering a couple quick questions. Um, people, a couple people are asking about elevation, and I'd say elevation can be a good thing because it can open up that view shed. For instance, this photo was taken in the Champlain Valley at an elevation, and of course, you have a much wider view shed than if you were down at lake level. Um, that being said, especially in Vermont, where most of our more mountainous regions aren't used a ton agriculturally, or uh, depending on the region, I guess, that the landscape may not be the best landscape to uh, promote grass and birds using your field, but we'll touch on that. Yeah, the other thing to remember is elevation alone isn't enough. So think about it this way. You could have um, a field that is at the bottom of sort of a depression in a mountainous area that is high elevation um, in terms of its, its baseline elevation, but relative to the land around it, it is still lower. And so the importance is that there is, that the field itself or that an area within the field even um, are higher than the surrounding landscape. So the, the field being higher than other fields around it is great. The other thing that we often find within a field is if there's sort of a a little um, rise in the land, they like, they really like to nest at the top of that rise where it's sort of flat and they have that great view. Um, so elevation is, is a great way to think about it, but it's important that it's not just elevation alone, it's, it's about relative elevation. So if you look here, the, the other important thing to understand about edges um, is that an edge can be at the very edge of the field, or it can be what we creating what we call a fragmenting feature. And you'll see some of these here, how they create different levels of impact visually. So you have your tree lines, which are obviously, you know, a very hard edge, really inhibit the line of view. Um, but then you have uh, this wire fence, um, something that's electric fencing is very common on agricultural properties. Um, and so it's not as impactful on a visual, from a visual sense, but it may still have some impact as a fragmenting feature. Um, so when we think about the degree to which that's gonna impact um, the birds, again, it really depends on the quality of the rest of the habitat and the extent to which, as we say, all of those other boxes are checked. Um, but, you know, it's better to not have those fragmenting features if possible. So another element is the surrounding landscape. Like Kevin said, um, it's better to, uh, even if there's, you have a high elevation upland field, um, even if it's a, a good size acreage wise and a good shape like we have in this field to the left, um, it probably still, there's a high chance it still won't have bobolinks or nesting grassland birds, simply because one of the ways that uh, these fields, we use the term colonized, they get colonized, is by returning birds, um, returning to their natal field, the field where they were born, um, and then arriving and finding other males who have already established territory. And then those younger males um, who've now arrived get bumped and they have to try to find habitat elsewhere. And so what happens is they go look for another quality field nearby. So in the case of the field on the left, um, it would just be highly unlikely that this field would be colonized from those other fields. Um, the other thing that's important to understand here is that uh, in areas like the field on the right, um, the surrounding fields can provide refuge if one of the fields are cut. So the challenge for the 25 acre field is 
if you were to uh, cut that field early, and we'll get more into mowing uh, later on, um, those birds would have very few options habitat wise as to where to go. So there's a lot more challenges there. Um, and Kevin, this is you. I am muted. Okay. Liza mentioned earlier on um, some of the threats we're going to be discussing. Uh, she mentioned that, of course, uh, landscape conversion or climate change are massive threats. But in this talk, we're really focusing on the threats you can address on your property level by altering your management regime. Uh, one threat that uh, a lot of hay fields may have that will also reduce the. Liza, next slide, please. One threat that um, a lot of hay fields face are invasive plants, such as the yellow rattle, which was newly introduced to Vermont from New Hampshire, and wild chervil, um, which looks pretty similar to Queen's An Queen Anne's lace, but is of course a different species. These can quickly take over a hay field, and it's really important to manage for invasive plants if they're present before you really wanna manage for grassland birds. We'll touch on management for invasives um, next section, but I just wanna, quickly say just a preface that management for invasive goes against most recommendations for managing for grassland birds. And so in the short term, it is kind of hard to manage for invasives because you're not managing for the birds, but in the long term, by managing for invasives, in the, uh, you'll eventually begin to start managing for grassland birds once they're gone. And then two other large threats, um, one is predation. Um, predation is a massive threat to grassland birds given that they nest on the ground so it's kind of hard to get out of harm's way. Domestic cats are the biggest killers of native birds in the U.S. Um, host of reasons for this. Uh, they are invasive and they are predators. Um, so barn cats or outdoor cats both have large impacts. Additionally, natural predators such as foxes and raccoons um, have increased numbers or artifi artificially inflated numbers near human settlements. Um, natural predators uh, near human settlements have more food sources or more housing, so they can find better grain or feed or can live in, say, a barn. So there's generally higher levels of those near farmsteads, which of course is where most of these hay fields are gonna be found. Intensive mowing, and I saw a question about what is intensive mowing. Um, I saw Liza just responded to that question actually. Um, Intensive mowing, I would say, is mowing two or three or more times a season. I guess a more working definition would be haying within 65 days of your previous hay. And we'll discuss that 65 minute, that 65 day um, number in a little bit. But just basically means more than doing one or two well-spaced hays per season. Liza, you muted. Sorry, I don't, I don't know. My video disappeared for a second. So I don't know if you can hear, see me, but I'm hoping you can hear me. Yes, we um, can see you and hear you. Okay, great. So um, we've sort of, we've talked about the habitat requirements of the birds and we've talked about some of the threats. So taking these two things into consideration um, and, and we'll talk about this in a bit, the needs of the landowner, there are a number of different ways we can go about managing on a property. And Kevin will talk about this later on, but um, it's important to understand that our approach uh, when we work with landowners is to really find a, um, a balance between all of these things so that there's a management plan that is sustainable financially, logistically, um, into the future for that landowner. There are a number of programs um, that Kevin will talk about that help landowners finan with financial assistance for some of the practices we're going to discuss. The challenge there is that those uh, those financial reimbursements are only available with a, a certain acres, uh, number of acres, um, and they are only, they're really targeted at uh, properties in the Champlain Valley because that's where the really prime um, grassland bird habitat is in the state, you know, makes a lot of sense with all the agricultural property there. Um, and so 
you know, this may not be an, even an option to a lot of landowners. Uh, so we're, we really try to find a balance and, you know, it, it's not a perfect option for the birds usually. It's not usually a perfect option for the landowner, but it's something where everyone gets something out of the balance. Um, and it's something that can be sustained over a period, of, a longer period of time. So the first thing, um, so, or the main management strategies are really what we're, we're going to talk about today are monitoring for the birds, um, particular mowing schedules and uh, mowing patterns that can help uh, protect the birds, ways to use our knowledge of habitat uh, needs of the birds to prioritize which fields get cut and when, um, <clears throat> and then Similarly, prioritization within a rotational grazing scheme that uh, would delay certain paddocks or eliminate them from rotation. So the first thing is uh, landowner monitoring. So it's important to understand that with bobolinks, presence does not necessarily mean breeding. Um, this is because uh, in, a, in some cases you might have a field that is adjacent to a field where bobolinks are nesting, even though they're not nesting in your field. Perhaps your field is five acres, it's not quite large enough for nesting, but your neighbor's field is 20 acres. Um, but come June, uh, that field gets hayed, and the bobolinks who were trying to nest in that field now need a place to at least forage and um, have safe shelter for the remainder of the breeding season. And you may find that around that time, um, you're seeing bobolinks in your field. Now that's great that your field can provide habitat for them, but it doesn't mean that they are going to breed. Uh, and we'll talk about that more, but bobolinks at a certain point in the season will not re-nest. Um, so presence does not necessarily mean breeding, and that's why it's really important important to monitor your property um, on a re fairly regular basis to get a better idea of what's going on. Um, the more monitoring you do, the better, because uh, if you are a landowner who needs to hay as early as possible for higher nutrient value hay or for a, a larger amount of hay um, from more than one cut, uh, the more you monitor, the better I idea you can get of when nesting is completed, um, when fledging is completed, and so you can feel confident that when you decide to mow, um, the birds have completed their nesting cycle. When you are monitoring, and we can help train you to monitor if that is something that you're interested in doing, um, it's important that while you do, you can walk through your fields that you don't actively search for nests. They are very good at hiding them, which is great, uh, but it also means that uh, you're probably more likely to step on a nest before you find it than you are to find it before you step on it. When you're out there monitoring what you're looking for uh, to be a sign of, of that breeding may and nesting may be happening on your property um, are these males, the, the males here on the left with the flashy um, yellow, black, and white, um, and the female looks rather like a, um, a large sparrow, um, but she is a, a bit cleaner on her breast than some of the other sparrows you might see um, in, in your grass and property. Um, and at the end of the presentation, we have an ID sheet that you can also print out uh, to use for monitoring. But you're gonna see the males flying around establishing territory. As the season progresses, you'll see males um, almost uh, tied to a particular area of the field. And that is, you're starting to see basically where males have nailed down where their territory is going to be for the season. Um, males will often fly while they're singing and they kind of look akin to a little wind-up toy. That's a very distinctive, um, if, if you're unfamiliar with bobolinks, that's sort of a distinctive uh, feature of them. And during this time when the females arrive, the females will arrive about a week after the first males arrive. Um, and you'll see the males chasing the females uh, during courtship. All of these things are a really good sign that you may have nesting happening on your property. And then 
Finally, the, the best sign is when later in the season, you see adults carrying stuff. So that could be nesting material in early spring, um, or later on, that might be food. And if you see adults carrying food, it means that there are chicks, because uh, birds, as a general rule, do not carry food that they are themselves are planning to eat. They don't carry around a snack for later, it's always for someone else. So that, that food is going to be for babies. And the other more gross kind of thing that they could be carrying around are fecal sacs. Um, and that's great because it means you have healthy babies eating and then pooping. Um, and the uh, adults are then carrying those fecal sacs away from the nest uh, to clean it. This is all happening on generally the same schedule every year. And um, no matter when nesting starts in your region, it does vary across uh, New England. But whenever it starts, it generally takes around 50 days. Um, and this tends to be the schedule that you, are, you would be seeing. Um, when, so we, we went over the, the courtship, um, the territory establishment, the courtship, and what you might be seeing during the, um, the nesting and the fledgling stage when the, the young are still in the nest and being fed by their parents. Um, but what following that uh, time, when they achieve sustained flight, as we call it, um, when they actually could feasibly fly well, uh, they are still fed by their parents for quite a while. And so what you're gonna see at that point is almost an explosion of what seems like a lot more female bobolinks in your field. And that is most likely the young that have fledged the nest. Another thing to watch out for, and this is again why monitoring is helpful, is that you may have the interactive effects of bobolink, your own bobolinks nesting in your field, as well as bobolinks coming in from another field that has gotten hayed. So as long as you're monitoring throughout the season, you're gonna be able to tease out these different um, possible options and really determine what's happening on your property. So we're gonna go over um, a, a sort of example landowner to bring some of these ideas into a real life context. So this landowner, new to Vermont, new to this property that was an agricultural property. Um, the landowner is not a farmer, but is going to be relying on, a, and this is a very typical story here in Vermont, that the, with fewer and fewer farmers, um, that the landowner is going to be relying on a farmer to mow for them. Because they have just moved to the property, they're unclear about the management um, in previous years, and they are also, uh, unsure whether or not they have bobolinks nesting anywhere on their property. And so our advice in this case would be for them to do this monitoring in year one. Rather than having a fight with your this, the person who's hanging for you um, for no reason, uh, you know, monitoring will help establish if there are bobolinks present, especially because in this case, you know, there's not a ton of really, really quality habitat available. So we would recommend that they monitor. And then if they do find that uh, nesting is happening in year one, that then they would work with their, um, with the farmer um, to prioritize which the, the properties, the fields that are the best habitat. Um, for different forms of delayed mowing. And that's what gets us into the next practice. So delayed mowing is one of the main things you'll hear about when we talk about managing for grassland birds. Um, August 1st is the date that you will hear from NRCS, from the Bobolink Project, from almost anyone and everyone who talks about grassland bird management. Um, and that's because that is the date by which most uh, young will have fledged and will be old enough to fly for both savanna sparrows and bobolinks across the region. Um, and uh, it also accounts for um, seasonal variability. So even in a late spring, 
where fields take a while to dry out and birds may be nesting, initiating nesting later, the August 1st date is almost always a safe date by which to mow. Uh, that being said, it's often not feasible for many farmers who need multiple cuts to get higher quality hay for dairy cows or other livestock. Um, so this is an option, uh, this is the best option, but it's um, not always feasible, which is why um, we're gonna talk in a little while about prioritization and why in the previous case, we would tell the landowner to monitor in order to decide where to push for this challenge, more challenging option. Um, so yes, so as I said, prioritization means determining where the best habitat is. And part of that is determining where the bobolinks already are, but part of that is also determining where the best habitat is regardless of bobolinks. Um, I sort of, I tend to say to landowners, you know, if you build it, they might come. So if you have the habitat, if you have all the um, characteristics that would suggest that bobolinks will be nesting there, uh, you have a much higher chance of it happening in future. Um, so you, in, in prior, working to prioritize which fields on your property get cut uh, earlier and which get delayed, you know, going through this checklist is a great way to figure out uh, which ones to prioritize. Kevin, this is you. Yeah, um, I just want to answer Katie's question lately. Uh, so what you're asking is if they double brood, they can. I'd say it's not very typical. It depends on the region. Uh, Champlain Valley, for instance, when they arrive earlier and it's warmer, they have more of a chance of double brooding, whereas Northeast Kingdom, not as much. Um, they do re-nest sometimes. If the nest is destroyed or mowed early enough in the season, they may make another nest and try again to have that one brood. Um, Bobolinks aren't as successful with that as savannah sparrows. Bobolinks may re-nest once or two times at most. Savannah sparrows have been found to re-nest, attempting to have that one first brood up to five times. So they can re-nest, but generally they won't be having a second brood, depending on the region. Yeah, Kevin, just to clarify that, because I th I don't. I just want to make sure this is clear to everyone. They will re-nest if their nest is destroyed early enough in the season, but they it is much it is not super common. It is is pretty rare that they will have that bobolinks will have two broods in a given season. Um, okay. So yeah. Cool. So let's talk about this first example. Um, so. This property combined is about 64 acres of field. Um, there's a good amount of cropland there as I've labeled. And we've kind of split it up into four or into five distinct parcels of field. Um, so constraints, he, the cutter, the farmer can delay um, cut maybe one field, maybe delay cut two fields, but they have to be able to cut to have um, fields to feed their livestock. Or to, they have to cut fields to have feed for the livestock during the winter when they cannot be grazed. Um, so I guess what field, would, I guess this is kind of a, a question to the group is what field would you suggest, um, you know, asking them to delay? Um, you can just kind of say by the color that's outlining it. So like which one is best, which one is worse? I'd love to kind of just have people think about the, the habitat constraints we've talked about and just kind of apply them a little bit to this scenario. If you don't mind chatting in the box, like just uh, what color they think is best, what color they think is worst. Well, yellow best, best yellow. Yeah, okay, cool. So everyone kind of is on the same page. 20, the 23 acre, the yellow block um, is definitely gonna be the best. It's the largest. Um, it is relatively regular sized and it doesn't have any major fragments to any side of it. It does have that hedgerow toward the north. It does have cropland to the east and south, but that's not going to be anything monumental such as if it was Interstate 89 bisecting it or if there was trails bisecting straight through the middle of the 23 acres. 
14 acres is okay. Again, it's pretty square, it's pretty open. It's just not as big as the 23 acres. Um, nine acres, uh, the, the orange and the red are okay. A little bit funky shaped, not terrible. And then, um, as someone mentioned, the the purple, the uh, the bluish turquoise is by far the worst. It's very linear, not much interior area. And so, when we're talking about delay mowing and say they need to get two cuts on some fields, one cut on another field, there's an alternate delayed mowing option, um, which does help you yield two cuts. So, as you mentioned, bobolinks will renest if their nests are destroyed early enough in the season. So if you can mow before June 1st and refrain from mowing for another 65 days, which is where that I mentioned 65 days is kind of like that intensive mowing number. Um, so that bring you to kind of mid July before you, before you mow again, that allows time for bobblings to re-nest between the two cuts. Um, however, this has only been really practiced in the Champlain Valley where it's a little bit more productive and where these springs come a little bit earlier. So depending on where you are in the state, this may not be feasible, but this is an option if you do need to get two cuts in as long as you can wait that 65 days between cutting. And then a mowing strategy to use, um, you know, ideally always, but especially if you're cutting before um, that safe mowing date is how you mow. If you mow kind of outwards in, you're basically going to corral all individuals that aren't able to fly yet into one area and they'll just be unfortunately lost in almost, essentially one mow. If you can use these other mowing strategies, they will either force them to one side of the field away from the mower rather than trapping them toward the center. Um, so that's a good example of the top left. The bottom left, you can kind of see they're cutting around the edge of the field and leaving the interior which is not ideal, but it is still okay. The top right shows kind of the opposite of what I was saying earlier, whereas instead of mowing into the center, they spiral outwards, pushing the offspring and the fledglings away from the center. And then on the bottom right, it shows them avoiding the higher, the higher up area with the better view shed. Um, and we'll either leave that till, le we'll, uh, till later on. It is important to note though, that although these help a lot, they also are not the perfect strategy because once the grass is lower, there is a lower likelihood of survival with less places to hide. However, for fledglings, when one day can mean the difference between not flying and flying, even just doing the strategy to give a small percent of the fledglings that extra day to get those flight feathers and flight muscles in will be helpful to them to survive. So it's not perfect, but it is a great strategy should you not be able to wait until all have already begun to flow, to fly. And now going back kind of to that previous example, this is what I would recommend to the landowner. As I mentioned, I would say delay cut the 23 acres in the red. Don't cut that until after August 1st, assuming it's the Champlain Valley. The areas in the green, the three nine acre parcels, I would say don't delay those. They're not prime habitat. Like if you need to get several cuts in, I would say those would be the fields to cut. And then I would suggest on the 14 acres doing a two cut delay. So mowing it before June 1st, waiting the 65 days and then mowing it again. And then they could still have some good nutrient quality hay while still maintaining that, uh, that population. In our examples, I never once am saying to just never cut it. I'm always saying to delay it. And that's because in addition to delaying haying too frequently, or to instead, instead of, sorry, rather haying too frequently, not haying at all can also result in fields just not being productive breeding grounds. With intensive mowing, it can turn the population into a sink. Uh, say you hay mid-June, that'll cause almost no bobblings to successfully fledge. Um, and then once they don't fledge, their parents will migrate back down south. Next spring, they will return to the same breeding grounds, trying again to, to have offspring. And if that's not managed well, over the X amount of years, the adults keep returning to the field, they will never have successful offspring, which is just detrimental to that entire population if they're not producing anything to replace the adults. And haying can cause deaths in many ways. Uh, you know, there's the initial mowing, that will just kind of kill any nestlings. 
but it also increases nest abandonment because females may be disturbed by the mowing activity and may just leave their nest even if it isn't um, initially destroyed by the mowing. And then when there's less grass, it's harder to hide the nests. So they may also fall victim to predation as well. With no mowing, um, say you don't mow it yearly, you mow it once every couple of years, then woody growth begins to take over. And within several years, it's just not a usable stage of hay to really be providing um, great nesting habitat. And when you're thinking about this, it's kind of funny because in some ways it's almost better to have no nesting than to have a population sink. Um, even though the sink may provide habitat early in the spring, it will rarely be successful long-term and will cause that sink, which can really be detrimental and exacerbate population declines. But if you have no nesting, anything that would return there will go somewhere else. And hopefully um, that somewhere else will be managed in a way that they will be able to have successful offspring. So before I move on to this, this landowner example, um, uh, one thing I'm noticing from people's responses is that there's some people who brush hog their fields or who have their, or who brush hog their fields um, semi-annually. And um, in the previous example or in the previous slide, um, one, of, one of the challenges with brush hogging is that um, if you don't brush hog it annually, you can um, be encouraging some of that woody growth uh, that you see here on the right. Um, and, if, and the other important difference between brush hogging and haying is that in haying, you're always taking that material off of the field. Whereas in brush hogging, often you're almost always, you're leaving the material uh, to decay on the field. Um, and there are some challenges there because with the litter being left on the field, um, if it's done too often uh, where it's not removed um, on some sort of regular basis, that, that creates a litter layer that is um, not preferred by bobolinks, but it also can, the litter layer itself can actually um, suppress the vegetation growth in terms of grasses. Uh, so there's sort of that one-two punch um, of that brush hogging uh, kind of can present. And so we just recommend that you both brush hog early enough in the year, you know, balancing between not mowing too early, but also not mowing too late um, or enough. And that if you are brush hogging, that you try to remove the litter off of that field um, every other year that you're brush hogging. Otherwise you risk uh, having a property that looks more like this. So moving on to a landowner who um, grazes their livestock. So the, um, this landowner has this nice big open area. Um, there's maybe some little hedgerow uh, in here with some fragmentation, but overall pretty huge amount of acreage that's pretty open. Um, they, uh, they have a small herd of beef cattle that they graze during the summer. And then they also provide their own hay uh, for winter feed. So they need to balance the needs of their grazing uh, cattle in the summer as well as the needs um, to hay for winter. And in this case, you know, uh, we would recommend monitoring to determine where um, the best habitat is. Uh, in this case, it's pretty clear just because it's a square very square field, but in other situations, um, monitoring can be helpful to figure out where the, the preferred area of a given field is for nesting. Um, identify that breeding, best breeding habitat, and then leave a paddock at that location out of rotation um, for ideally 60 to 65 days to give it that, that preferred window, um, but at minimum 42 to 50 days uh, rest before grazing again. And this way there's enough um, nesting uh, habitat, enough vegetation that's high enough at the beginning of the nesting period. Um, the birds are undisturbed for the, the majority of the duration of nesting. Um, 
before the animals are let back into that paddock again. It's important to um, mention that these birds developed with ungulates. They developed with bison um, in their native range, but the difference between the way bison uh, move across the landscape and uh, the way that we traditionally or often graze cattle um, and other livestock is that bison will graze an area and then not return for a long, long time. And they will move through that area fairly quickly. Whereas often we're grazing livestock for longer periods of time or coming back and hitting the same property again with grazing at a, at a quicker rotation. Um, so it is okay for livestock to go into the uh, a paddock with bobolinks, um, but you just increase the risk that a nest will get destroyed um, or a, you know, a nestling may be killed. So in this case, this would be the advice that we give, you know, the best habitat is going to be in that center paddock. The second best habitat is going to be just below that, uh, close to the hayfield area. Um, and so we would recommend leaving those two to the end of rotation um, and, and then taking this um, area uh, for haying for winter feed. Now, it's important that this is just a rough estimation of a rotation schedule. Um, we recommend uh, talking to UVM Extension or grazing specialists and consulting them on exactly how, how many paddocks you would need in a rotational grazing setup and how often you'd need to move your animals. But if you mention to them that um, grassland birds is part of your management goals, um, they can work with you and we can work with you to figure out which paddocks could be delayed. Um, the other thing that's uh, a sad reality um, in hay fields, just like it is uh, in other ecosystems in Vermont, are invasive plants. So one of the challenges with delayed mowing, uh, this is a challenge period, but a challenge that sometimes is actually exacerbated by delayed mowing, are invasive plants. Um, delayed mowing can sometimes give them an added uh, leg up in establishing themselves. And so the two main ones we're concerned about in grasslands here in Vermont are yellow rattle and wild chervil. Yellow rattle, um, I believe is present in New York, but seems to be coming into Vermont from um, over the border from New Hampshire. Um, so is most prevalent right now in the Connecticut River Valley, but is definitely something to be work looking out for in other regions of Vermont. Um, for this species, you for this, uh, Invasive, you want to cut early and often for several years, and you want to mow down um, to approximately four inches. So not low enough to actually scalp the ground, um, but low enough to really get, get at the plant. Um, and then for both this and wild chervil, it's really important, and I realize it's very impractical in a lot of cases, but to clean the machinery after use before using it in a, another field or moving it to another property, because that's the way that these things get spread. For wild chervil, um, if the invasion, if you catch the invasion early, and that's like the key in, in any invasion uh, scenario is catching it early, um, you want to hand pull the plant whenever possible, but then uh, mowing becomes one of the strategies to uh, deal with an invasion. And you just want to be careful not to mow after June um, as that can reduce seed spread. So the challenge in this situation is that we've been telling you about delayed mowing this entire time, and now we're going to tell you to cut. Um, and that can be really, really hard for some landowners. Um, say you have a beautiful property like this one, and it's it's been perfect bobbling habitat and you've been really committed to delayed mowing. Um, it can be really hard to go back to um, cutting heavily uh, and sacrificing all that hard work. The thing that's important to remember is that an invaded field is not going to be bobbling habitat and it's easier to deal with an invasion. Um, it's perhaps only feasible to deal with an invasion at the, at the onset, at the beginning. And so we say, you know, think about the long-term uh, benefits that, of this field for bobolinks and not the short-term. So deal with the invasion so that um, down the road this can be uh, bobolink habitat. Yeah, also, can you go back for a second? On top of that, too, um, if you can catch them early enough, especially yellow rattle, it stays pretty localized unless you spread it to other parts of your field. So if you can catch it early enough and you can just intensively mow where it is 
in theory, you can still leave decent bits of your property delay mode. It's just, you have to really focus on where it is to prevent it from establishing so that you do have to intensively mow your entire field. If you can get it early on, you have a good chance of being able to save most of your field as long as it doesn't establish over there. Yeah, and the other thing is, uh, and to build on that, often these invasions come in at the field edges. Mm -hmm. um, edges are just an area of disturbance. Um, and, and, but thankfully, edges also happen to be where bobblinks uh, try to avoid. And so <clears throat> sometimes in the case of an invasion, as Kevin says, you can leave the interior habitat um, delayed and then just intensively mow on the edges to address that invasion problem. We'll wind up here is to put a couple of mentions in for financial incentive programs. Um, we do have several in the state. One is the Bobbling Project, which is a private project that um, funders can donate money to. And then there's a bidding process between landowners uh, to find out who will receive the funds per acre to, to put their uh, land in delay mowing. This does have a three year limit to it, so you can only have it for a short period of time. NRCS Equip is kind of similar. Um, there's a little bit more variation in the types of programs that they offer. Uh, that too has a three-year limit. Both the Bobbling Project and Equip are pretty, are pretty localized to the Champlain Valley and occasionally the Upper Valley. So outside those regions of interest, it may be harder to get funding. And then one other um, financial program is CSP which is um, a relatively new program from NRCS. I don't know a whole ton about it other than they're really starting to push it hard. The way that it was phrased to me is that EQIP is getting your property into a great state. So that'd be kind of like when you'd be taking care of your invasives, when you'd be delayed mowing, or we'd be intensively mowing to get rid of your invasives. And then CSP is kind of just keeping it in that state that EQIP got it to. So whether it be you get rid of all your invasives during the three years of EQIP, then you get CSP on top of that, and then it's just maintaining that healthy habitat during your time with CSP. So they kind of build on top of each other. Um, that would be something worth reaching out to NRCS about um, if, it, if it's interesting to you. What we at VCD do during our, uh, with our grass and bird outreach is we give technical assistance. So say you don't have enough acreage to, um, to meet the requirements for either Bobbling Project or NRCS, which are generally about 20 acres, um, or you're not in like the target region that they focus on, we still are here to come. We'll visit with landowners, um, kind of talk about the landowner's goals and their needs and try to come up with ways to assist them with giving advice on how to manage their land. Um, we may point them in the direction of NRCS or UVM Extension but we'll do our best as bird biologists to really read your landscape and make suggestions on where we think is prime habitat um, versus areas that I might just be, you know what, just don't even bother to lay, just go cut that. Like we will, we're kind of here just try and give you advice on managing your land for your goals. And this also goes on to, uh, I think it was Jack that asked earlier is, um, does your group approach landowners with potential good nesting areas if others point them or point you to them to enlist their help to improve the habitat? Absolutely. Um, we do have a lot of success with neighbors acting as grassland ambassadors being like, hey, my neighbor, um, you know, here's their address or here's their email, their phone number. Like I, they have a lot of habitat, maybe reach out to them and ask if they'd be interested in potentially talking more or give them a pamphlet and just kind of see if they are interested in learning more. Um, and we've had a lot of success with that because it's really nice to get those local inroads that know the area, that know the people, that know what kind of the culture of the area and can point us in the right direction. So being a grassland ambassador, um, like we try to be grassland ambassadors, we try to recruit other people to help us with that as well. Um, and you know, say you have, um, like I saw someone in here, I believe, I believe they mentioned they were from Audubon. Yeah. From Adirondack Audubon. Like we'd be happy to mail you some pamphlets that we came up with, um, you to distribute to other people as well. So we're kind of here to help other people, um, help everyone, help organizations, whoever's interested in grassland management, how can they do that? And the next slide shows some of the resources that we offer that are all available for free on our website. Um, again, again, I'm happy to mail some to uh, someone that has neighbors they would be like, they'd like to talk about or to mail them to neighbors that are recommended to me. Um, but we have this, uh, basic ID sheet on the front side it has Bob Link, Savannah Sparrow, and Meadowlark. On the back side it has 
some confusing species as well as kestrel and harrier. So that's for people that really have like a basic knowledge of birding. They're not really interested in going out to their forest, do a lot of birding, but they really want to know what's in their hay field. The um, calendar on the right is a bobbling nesting calendar. It's pretty generalized for the Champlain Valley, but it kind of goes like a step-by-step-ish, um, week-by-week representation of what's happening in the bobbling life cycle. Uh, we update that yearly. And then in the middle is a pamphlet that we also have on the website to print out, or I can mail you one. And that goes over, kind of summarizes a lot of what we've discussed here, um, as well as just kind of some other background information. And as always, VCE, um, we're always looking for people to help us with our projects, uh, whether it be Vermont eBird, or uh, if you do have a uh, cropland and you're interested in participating in our lady beetle survey, we're currently trying to Alice all Vermont's lady beetles. Um, sorry, it's my neighbors being loud. Uh, so please look out, uh, reach out to us, um, you know, check out our newsletter. We do like uh, doing, we do weekly or uh, we do monthly newsletters and we also do uh, monthly kind of field guides to the season. They kind of go over a lot of, uh, a lot of what's going on in nature. So if you're interested in any of that, please, please uh, reach out to VCE and we'd love to have you involved. Um, and also, if you uh, have questions about your grassland property, um, but you feel like uh, what you can get out of an email or a presentation like this um, may not be quite enough uh, for you to actually then take that and implement that on your property, um, Kevin will be doing site visits this summer for, we, we generally focus on, uh, because we're located in the, in the upper valley of Vermont, um, we generally focus on uh, Vermont and as well as Upper Valley landowners in New Hampshire. Um, but if there's a reason to make our way over to New York, Massachusetts or other areas, um, if there's a group of landowners that can could certainly be possible. Um, so if you are within the Vermont, New Hampshire region um, and you are interested in getting a site visit uh, to your property, that's uh, something you can definitely contact us about that grasslands at vtecostudies.org email is the way to go. Yes, um, Southern, I'm happy to come down to Southern VT. And, um, and I'll just say, add on to what Kevin was saying about grassland ambassadors. Um, we are happy to sort of cold call uh, landowners that you mm -hmm. think are, uh, have really good grassland habitat, but often we find that if you have a connection with the landowner, it works so much better. Um, you know, very few people like uh, being asked to do something additional to than all the things they're already managing. Um, and usually that, that goes over better uh, if it's a friendly face doing it. Mm -hmm. So, um, so we really empower you to be grassland ambassadors. You don't have to be expert bird biologists. You don't have to remember everything we said in this presentation. You just have to be able to recognize what grassland habitat is, which hopefully you can now do. And if you feel like you still can't, we would be happy to talk to you more. Um, and then you just have to um, be a uh, a charismatic champion for birds, which I'm sure all of you are more than capable of doing. Um, and we're happy to work with you on that. Mm -hmm. uh, so with that, I think, I just wanna make sure, um, oh, would you potentially do, yeah, so now's the time for questions if you have any. Um, uh, yeah. Christine says, would you potentially do another talk for a targeted group of landowners or of neighbors? So uh, last season, something I found that was really successful, um, really sort of a non-threatening uh, way for people who were thinking about doing grassland management, but really didn't want to commit to anything was to have um, a landowner in a particular area who really was interested uh, schedule a site visit with us and then invite some of their neighbors who also had grassland property but really weren't sure about this whole grassland habitat management thing and that way they get to see okay what are the habitat needs you know we talk about a lot of what we talked about tonight with that landowner um, we may talk about monitoring with them and then the landowners that came to that site visit um, can decide one way or the other if they want to manage and then possibly if they want a site visit themselves. So that would be a really great way to do a, a talk, so to speak, for a targeted group of neighbors. Mm -hmm. Do you have any, any other questions? 
in the group. I hope we got to all the ones that were already in the chat box, yeah, I believe. Looking over. I think we did. One other thing I'd like to mention to folks is that um, this presentation uh, is being recorded and will be put up on the VLT website and also shared with the VCE. So you'll be able to access that. If you go to the VLT.org website, up at the top, there's a little uh, YouTube icon. And if you click on that, you should be able to see it. It'll be there in the next day or two. And we'll share it with Liza and Kevin so that they can put it up on their site as well. Well, I just want to say one thing as well um, to Christine. She just asked, like, well, she didn't ask. She said that she has some grassland area, but between her and her neighbor be a good chunk. And I think it's really important to remember with grasslands that birds don't see property lines. So if you have five acres and your neighbor has five acres, you got 10 acres of habitat right there. And if you can somehow talk to them to work out managing as a duo and managing as one land parcel, that's just as good as 10 acres owned by one person. So especially when you have an area with lots of neighbors that may be involved in this, it's easy, or not easy, but it works well to try to discuss management as a unit, as a land unit, more so than parcel by parcel. Of course, it's not always possible, but it is something to think about that birds aren't gonna see property boundaries. They're not gonna see town boundaries. They're just gonna see one solid chunk of hay. Kevin, um, since I have the presentation pulled up, can you throw up the link for the multi, the, um, the videos so that anyone who's interested in wading more into bobolink ecology yes. can yeah, go ahead and watch that. So if, if you're unfamiliar with North Branch Nature Center, they've been hosting um, a whole slew of really great video uh, webinars on a variety of content. Um, we did one for them uh, on grassland bird ecology with a focus on bobolinks. Um, and it really delves into more their full life cycle ecology of their full life cycle. So if that's of interest to you, definitely check that out. Um, I'm about to just link, uh, I, I'm not sure if it's possible here, could we send out the files I mentioned to everyone who's in attendance, like the, the, the calendar and everything, or should I just put it in the, in the chat now? Uh, we usually do a follow-up email, so we certainly can send PDFs or links to those, okay, cool. definitely. Awesome, because we have, I'll make sure that everyone here gets the nesting calendar um, the PDF pamphlet and the uh, basic bird ID sheet. We also on our website, which I will link right here for our management resources, you find all this there. We also have a fact sheet um, from UNH Extension on Yellow Rattle and from the Nature Conservancy Vermont on Wild Sherbel. So a couple of the resources there. Um, I'll try to add to it if I come across anything, but I think for the most part, those are a good way to get started. And if people have more questions or more, you know, more pointed uh, points they want to ask, um, just email me and I'm more than happy to see if I can find you the answer, or find your journal article or something that will help you out. Uh, the other thing I just want to say is um, if you are coming out of this presentation feeling like, man, I'm really disappointed. I don't have grassland bird habitat and I really am not going to, um, put in the work to get my old field or shrubland kind of area to a, a hay field. Um, never fear, shrubland birds are amazing too. Uh, and they need habitat just as much. Um, and so uh, we would, we are not shrubland bird experts. Uh, we uh, can certainly give you some basic recommendations, but um, in Vermont, we would point you to Audubon Vermont um, are definitely a good resource for shrubland bird habitat management. Um, in New Hampshire, we work a lot with Matt Tarr. Um, he's a, yeah, Mark, Mark Labar at Audubon. Um, Margaret Fowle also does a lot of work uh, with shrubland birds at Audubon, Vermont. Um, uh, Matt Tarr is a, works with UNH Cooperative Extension, so he's a great resource for landowners in New Hampshire um, who want to manage for shrubland birds as well. Um, and we hear Otter Creek Audubon does some great work on golden wing warblers. Absolutely. Um, importantly, gold, while golden wing warblers are so cool, I saw one the other day and I almost exploded. But um, there are other shrubland bird species and um, Golden wing warblers are not as common across the state, but you can still totally support shrubland bird, other shrubland bird species across Vermont, um, and they can certainly help you do that. 
Uh, yeah. If you forget any of this and you want to reach out to us and say, what were those shrubland bird resources again? You can absolutely do that. We yeah, are happy I, to help. I just want to point out that like, while we're discussing about grassland birds and I am very passionate about grassland birds, we are by no means saying that you should go cut down your forest for grassland bird habitat. Forests are important. You know, early successional shrub is important. Pollinator habitat is important. We're simply giving resources for people that would like to manage grasslands. But we're not saying that you should go and, you know, destroy every place to make them a grassland. You want to, we're just here to conserve nature in any way that we can. And if you want to conserve grasslands, we're trying to help you. But we're not, you know, advocating for clear-cutting Vermont again or anything like that. Absolutely. I totally see um, a, a great opportunity here for agricultural uh, producers and properties to become part of the conservation uh, conversation if they aren't already. Um, and I think all of us who live in Vermont and New England as a whole feel very much that agricultural the agricultural landscape is as a part of our heritage as the forested one. Um, and so finding ways that it can all work towards supporting to biodiversity across the landscape is something I think we really strive for with our grasslands work. And again, uh, ladies, can you just go back to show the grassland email? Yep, so that again, grasslands at vtecostudies.org. Um, reach out to me with questions, planning a site visit, you know, anything that I can help you with. Um, if I can't help you, I will point you in the direction of someone that can. At VCE, we have a great community of people. Um, we work with people in, across the New England area, you know, New York, New Hampshire. So I'm, I hope that'll be a great resource uh, for whatever you hope to do with your parcel of grasslands or shrublands or early sessional, whatever. Great. Well, and we just want to say thank you to Vermont Land Trust also for hosting this event. Um, they're an incredible organization. We're really excited to be partnering with them. Thanks, Liza. It was really great to have you and Kevin here tonight to present this information. It's such a great resource for landowners in Vermont. I really appreciate the time you put into putting this presentation together and putting it on for folks. So thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for everyone for coming out.